This is Susan Patrone reading from Throw Like a Woman, a little bit from Chapter One. The third week of the regular season, Andy's Little League team got discount tickets to see the Indians play the Tigers. Brenda went as a parent chaperone, and John went because he was the younger brother and would raise holy hell if he couldn't come along. Even with the discount, tickets for all three of them, plus factoring in a hot dog and a drink each, put a serious dent in the entertainment budget. Brenda had made a no-souvenirs rule for the outing, but when the boys saw the test-your-speed pitching cage, they begged to be allowed to try. It didn't help matters that every other boy on Andy's team tried it, as did all five chaperoning parents and two other accompanying siblings. She hated caving into peer pressure, but she didn't want Andy and John to be the only ones not to have a go. She took some of the money she had budgeted for snacks. She didn't really need a hot dog or a drink, so Andy and John could each take a turn. Andy was pleased with his top speed of 48 miles an hour. John's best try was 33, which disappointed him. Carl, Andy's coach, kept trying to tell him that 33 miles an hour was great for a kid his age, but it didn't help. Brenda saw the familiar pink blush spreading up John's face. John's tantrums hadn't eased up, and Brenda walked the fine line between trying to be understanding and not wanting to spoil him. Let me try again, John whined. I know I can throw harder than that. Brenda put an arm on John's shoulder and walked him a little bit away from the rest of the group. If I give you the money for another turn, then I can't buy you a hot dog. Why not? I want a hot dog, John said loudly, the tears in his eyes threatening to start falling any second. Brenda felt herself blushing as red as John's face. Why can't I do both? Sweetie, I'm sorry, she lowered her voice. You had one turn already and you did great, I, but I don't have enough money with me. Carl wandered over and put a hand on John's tiny shoulder. Come on, sport, I'll spot you another try. He looked up at Brenda with a smile. You don't mind, do you? You don't have to do that, she said. I want to, Carl replied as he walked back with John over to the pitching cage. Thank you, Brenda said. I'll pay you back, she called after him. But Carl just gave a little wave that said, no need to. Carl coached his son's little league team and was always patient with the kids, even the bench warmers. He was one of those men who seemed kind enough and decent enough that you couldn't believe some other woman had gotten rid of him. Brenda wondered if Carl's ex-wife ever called him a jerk under her breath or wished he'd be stricken with a bad case of crabs. John was all smiles as he took the first of the three baseballs offered to him by the man running the pitching cage. He threw another 33 miles an hour and then a 35 mile an hour pitch. John was reaching for his third and last ball when he stopped and turned to Brenda. Mom, you haven't had a chance to pitch yet, he said. Brenda tried not to get misty at her son's gesture. Oh, that's very sweet of you to think of me, John, but it's okay, she said. He turned and handed the ball to her. It's your turn, Mom. Brenda heard a little aw from the other chaperoning parents as John moved aside. She was touched by his generosity and figured she'd just throw the ball and get the boys to their seats. Ball in hand, Brenda approached the faux pitcher's mound in the middle of the stadium concourse. A quick glance showed her that every kid on the team, as well as the adults and tag-along siblings, did she really just now notice that they were all male, was watching her. A few people on the concourse had even stopped to watch, as if a 40-year-old woman with saddlebag hips couldn't pick up a baseball without embarrassing herself. She stopped for a moment and focused on the image of the catcher painted on the electronic backstop. The guy running the pitching cage said, Anytime you're ready, sweetheart. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw him flash a condescending smile. I'm not your sweetheart, she muttered. Without thinking, she threw. She heard the familiar thwump and a small murmur of approval from the men standing around her. She looked up at the digital clock that displayed the pitch speed. It read 72 miles an hour, which just seemed unbelievable. The guy running the game looked more than surprised, but just said, Not bad. (laughs) That was more than not bad, Carl said. That was great. Here. He shoved a few good dollars at the guy and handed Brenda three more baseballs. Would you do that again, please? This time, Brenda didn't protest. She took one of the baseballs and faced the painted catcher again. She didn't look around, but could hear some of the guys talking about her last pitch. She would swear a few more people had stopped to watch. Fine. Let them watch. Brenda's next three throws were 79, 77, and 82 miles an hour. She stared at the display for a moment, trying to figure out where that 82 came from. All the people standing around congratulated her. Some mumbled that the radar must be broken, that there was no way a woman could throw that hard. She saw a couple flashes of light, like someone taking a picture. The game was about to start, and the boys started running to their seats. As she and the other parents tried to get all the kids situated without losing anyone... Carl mentioned that he played baseball in the local Roy Hobbs League and maybe Brenda would be interested in playing. 
Roy Hobbs like Bernard Malamud's Roy Hobbs, she asked. Yeah, The Natural. Great movie. Great book. <laughs> Never read the book. I'm more of a, not much of a fiction reader, Carl said, as he gave a quick look around to see that they hadn't lost anyone. Josh, Ben, stay with the group, he called to his son and another boy who were dawdling behind. I'm more into history and biography. So anyway, it's the Veterans League. 38 and over, so you have a few guys who think they're hot stuff, and a couple of them still are. But mainly it's just guys who love to play baseball. You'd be great. I don't know. I haven't played hardball since I was a kid, and I can't hit. Don't worry about it. We use a DH. Josh, Ben, get away from the beer stand. Their conversation was permanently interrupted by the process of getting all the boys into their seats without losing anyone. Brenda ended up in the row in front of Carl, with John on her right and a stranger on her left. Andy was next to John, talking only to the boys on his right or behind him and trying to pretend that he wasn't with his mom and little brother. Once the boys had gotten their hot dogs and drinks, they settled down and were quiet for the first couple of innings, giving Brenda a little time to think. She considered the fact that she had thrown a baseball an improbable 82 miles an hour. She might have cellulite, a sacking rear end, and a stretch marked stomach, but she had an arm. It was a satisfying thought. What are you smiling about, Mom? John asked in between innings. Nothing much, she said with a little smile. Just happy to be here with you and Andy. Mr. Fleischman asked you to play baseball with him, didn't he? Brenda hadn't realized that John had overheard their conversation. Yes, he did. What do you think? Should I join a baseball team, too? Yeah, you should. You'll need a new mitt, John said sagely. Your old softball mitt stinks. But I think it's a good idea. Then everybody on the family will be on a team. Andy's on the Bears. I'm on the Twins. Dad's on the Beerholics. And you'll be on a team. Brenda actually snorted. Dad's on the what? The Beerholics? Yeah, it's his softball team. Is a Beerholic somebody who likes beer a lot? Yes. Like how sometimes you say you're a chocoholic because you like chocolate? Yes. The Beerholics play on Monday nights, so we haven't seen any of their games, but Dad and Darlene told us about it. Andy had evidently heard at least part of the conversation because he turned to John and punched him on the arm. Oh, Mom, Andy hit me, John wailed. I can't believe you told Mom about Darlene, Andy snapped in what was obviously meant to be a whisper, but was loud enough to be heard three rows away. John started slapping at Andy, who waved him off with a laugh that only infuriated John more. As embarrassed as she had been in recent memory, Brenda managed to cease the escalation of hostilities by moving John to her other side. John was silent until just after the seventh inning stretch, when he looked up at her and said, I'm sorry I told you about Dad's girlfriend. He looked like he was about to cry, as though even uttering the name Darlene had been treason of the highest order. Brenda put her arm around him. It's okay, sweetie. I didn't know her name, but I figured Dad might have a girlfriend. He's allowed to. We're not married anymore. You know that. He's allowed to date. But you don't have a boyfriend, John whispered in a voice so plaintive that Brenda had to lean in very close to hear him over the noise of the ballpark. I live with the two greatest guys on earth, she whispered back. I don't need anybody else. This is Susan Patrone reading Chapter One of The Super Ladies. Imagine the woman you can't see. Imagine the woman who can't be seen. It sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? In both cases, there's an invisible woman. But the distinction is both grammatical and metaphysical. The first is a failure of the viewer's attention. The second is the woman's choice. The woman you can't see is actually easy on the eyes, if a bit on the short side. She's thin, not stick figure thin, but the kind of thin that comes from years of running and countless hours contorting on a yoga mat in an effort to maintain until she dies, to remain as lean and wiry and, let's face it, attractive for the next 47 years as she was for the first 47. Her grandmother McQuestion, the one from whom Abra McQuestion inherited a first name and not much else, lived to be 94, and that has always seemed as good as an age as any to aspire to. It's the age, 47, that keeps you from seeing her. 47 is not old, not the way Methuselah and Dirt and George Burns were old. It is, however, old enough to divert the infamous male gaze to other, younger subjects. It's old enough to be ignored. For instance, 47 is probably double the age of the two young women who couldn't see Abra and walked right in front of her in the grocery store. She stopped by after work to pick up some avocados for the guacamole she was supposed to bring to the office Cinco de Mayo party the next day. She wasn't particularly fond of office parties, 
but senior staff at Hoffman Software Solutions were expected to set a good example. It didn't help matters that much of the office still thought Abra was part Mexican instead of half Dominican and assumed this was a major holiday for her. Tomorrow, Mike Horowitz, the head of finance, would no doubt give her two thumbs up and chirp, Viva Mexico! Every single time they passed in the hallway. So much to look forward to, she thought as she approached the prominent Cinco de Mayo display near the produce section. Bags of tortilla chips and jars of the store's private label salsa were displayed on wooden crates, neatly arranged on a round table with a red, green, and white striped tablecloth. Next to the table were two gigantic wooden bowls of avocados, one marked conventionally grown, the other organic. Abra took the same attitude toward purchasing organic produce as she did toward food safety while traveling in third world countries. If you don't eat the peel, you don't have anything to worry about. She was a step away from the non-organic bowl when two younger women sidled up to the display and cut directly in front of her. Their shiny, blonde, highlighted hair was only inches away from Abra's nose. Excuse me, Abra said. The young women either didn't hear or didn't care to acknowledge her presence. They just went right on choosily selecting avocados, chatting away about nothing, shifting their ridiculously curvy hips from one shapely leg to another. Abra had been young once, young and hot. She didn't begrudge these girls their youth or their unblemished skin or their pipe cleaner-like upper arms. Her own arms had better definition, enough to consistently garner compliments whenever she wore a sleeveless shirt. This wasn't a competition of appearance. What troubled her was their complete dismissal of her existence. Abra drew herself up to her full five feet two inches, willing herself to be as large as possible. Excuse me, but I was here first, she said. You just cut in front of me. The toady sidekick turned first. Then the second, the queen bee turned around. Oh, sorry, the queen bee said. Her voice dropped to a low register on the second syllable, making the apology sound decidedly ironic. We didn't see you. Having already gotten what they came for, the two young women walked away. As they passed the oranges, one whispered something to the other, and they both giggled. You weren't invisible. They were just assholes. This was Catherine's answer the next morning during their run. She and Abra met up most mornings to run through Euclid Creek Park, a narrow metro park that snaked alongside a rare two-and-a-half-mile stretch of suburban creek that wasn't culverted, Sometimes four miles in the morning is the only st- thing standing between me and homicide. This was another Catherineism. She was given to declarative statements. Running was the basis of their friendship. They had met 12 years earlier during the five-mile Memorial Day race at John Carroll University, whose campus was just a few miles down the road. The race had taken place the day after Catherine's fir- 35th birthday. 35 felt like a make-or-break year in every aspect of her life, career, marriage, fertility. It was the year she completed her master's in biology as a teacher that met a pay raise, and it was the year she and Hal decided she would keep trying to get pregnant for just a little longer. After that, maybe adoption, maybe consider life as a child-free couple. For the first half mile of the race through twisty, hilly university heights, Catherine had been aware of the ultra-fit woman with insanely curly hair who seemed to have taken up permanent residence half a step behind her left shoulder. She tried speeding up to drop her, but the woman kept pace easily. In smaller races, Catherine could typically place in her age group if she ran smart, not going out too fast and running negative splits the whole way. The stranger running just behind her with the overly placid expression that made it appear she wasn't even trying looked to be approximately the same age. She'd kick herself at this chick placed ahead of her. Catherine did the first mile in 702. And a 5K, that wouldn't be a problem. For a five-miler, it was too quick. She was already sucking wind from going out too fast. Instead of doing negative splits with a little gas left in the tank to sprint the last eighth of a mile, she let the skinny chick behind her get under her skin and make her blow her race strategy. Easing up her pace made her a little less annoyed at the woman behind her. As she slowed, she faintly but distinctly heard the words, Oh, thank God, coming from somewhere next to her. She looked to her left and saw the skinny chick still running next to her. It took all her self-control not to speed up again. Repeating, just run your own race, to herself over and over, she almost didn't hear the skinny chick say, you set a good pace. She didn't sound out of breath. Catherine tried not to huff as she replied, thanks. I haven't raced in ages. 
so I thought I'd follow someone with a challenging pace. Hope that's okay. She was silently pleased that the woman audibly sucked in a gulp of air before saying the words, challenging pace. Well, the skinny chick might have a complexion to die for, but she was at least human. Catherine smiled and gave a quick, sure, in reply. They ran next to each other in silence for the next two miles. Catherine noticed that the woman had an almost perfect stride, loose but controlled upper body, and quick legs that hardly seemed to touch the ground. She was built like a runner, too. Not tall, but proportionately long-limbed and lean. Catherine wondered when the last time was this chick had eaten a brownie. As they ran, she became aware that her own pace had grown steadier and smoother, and when the timekeeper at mile three called out, 2247, she realized she was still well on pace to come in under her goal of 38 minutes. Reluctantly, she had to admit she enjoyed running with this stranger. You're good, she said finally, aware that this was a fairly hollow statement. There were plenty of good runners in this race. It was just that this skinny chick was clearly more than your average recreational runner. The woman smiled, a broad, genuine grin. Thank you, she said. Then, almost as if she were admitting a juvenile arrest, added, I was a sprinter in high school and college. She took a deep breath. What about you? Catherine smiled back and managed to say, My only organized sport was slam dancing. I was kind of a punk. My senior year in high school, I was the only one at regionals with a mohawk, the woman I offered. Catherine tried not to slow down her pace as they talked, but this woman was turning out to be kind of cool. Excellent, she replied. Somehow this exchange cemented a mutual spark, a feeling of kinship, and they comfortably ran alongside each other to the end of the race. They both began their final sprint at the same moment, and when they hit the chute at the finish, Amber let Catherine go first. They finished a second apart. That feeling of camaraderie, not competition, was still what Catherine got when she ran with Abra. No one else could get her motivated to run four miles at 5.30 in the morning. Sometimes they talked on their morning runs. Mostly, they just listened to the pad-pad-pad of their own shoes on the pedestrian trail that ran through the park. In the dead of Cleveland winters, they'd hit adjacent treadmills at the Hillcrest YMCA. There was something deliciously hypnotic about the never-ending whir of the treadmill in the gym, that sometimes seemed to propel her feet forward involuntarily. The only problem was the scenery never changed. Catherine preferred running outdoors. She loved the infinite variety of the world. No matter how many times they ran the same route, there was always a different bird singing a different song or an unusual cloud formation to catch her eye. It usually took a mile or so before Catherine started feeling like her body hit equilibrium. In the first few minutes of her run, she could almost feel her cells pulling glucose from her blood and devouring it could feel her muscles demanding more and more oxygen, and always, always could feel her heart and lungs struggling to keep up with the demand. Time was when she could start running and seemingly within a few steps feel warmed up and ready to go at a race pace. Now that she was a little older, it seemed to take longer and longer to get to that delicious moment of balance when all her muscles were working in sync and she had oxygen to burn. They hadn't changed the route. It was her body that was changing, had changed. As they ran, Catherine felt the slightest little jiggle in her lower belly. That was another recent development, one that seemed to coincide with the cessation of her period. The lack of estrogen had altered the nature of her body fat. Screw getting older, she thought, and willed herself to pass up Abra. The park followed the creek downhill. They ran an out-and-back loop. Geography necessitated that the first half of their run was downhill and the second half uphill. They could have driven to the low end of the park so that the uphill portion of the run was first, but driving just to run seemed like a waste of time. Running uphill is decidedly more difficult than running downhill, especially when it's the second half of the run. It hurts. The hurts part was the crux of Catherine's love-hate relationship with their near-daily route. She disliked the pain, but loved the feeling of pushing her body past the point of uncomfortable. It was the closest a middle-aged suburban female might get to feeling like a warrior on a regular basis. At their usual turnaround this morning, Abbott didn't slow her pace. If anything, she sped up a little. Catherine kept up with her for about half a mile, then felt herself starting to fall behind. The pace was just too aggressive. Jeez, give an old lady a break, she huffed, trying to keep pace. They weren't even on the steep part yet. She hated to think a hill she ran every day could break her, but there it was. Abra jogged back and stopped in front of Catherine, hands on her hips. I'm four months older than you, she said pointedly, but breathing a little heavy. You won't be 47 until the end of the month. She started back up the hill at the same pace. Catherine ran up the hill after her. 
Did those girls at the grocery store piss you off that much, she asked? Typically, they wouldn't allow themselves to walk until they at least reached the crest of the last hill at the end of the park. Abra didn't reply, but cut her pace down to a slow jog. It was enough of an answer until they were out of the park and on the sidewalk by the war memorial. To the left was East Anderson and Catherine's house. To the right, West Anderson and Abra's house. They stood on the cracked, slate-slab sidewalk for a minute, catching their breath before they went their separate ways. Then Abra said, Yes, those skanky, pissy little brats at the grocery store annoyed me far more than they should have. She sighed, not a catching-her-breath sigh, but a genuine, melancholy-infused sigh. 